What's up my stat stars? Michael Prinjak here, ready to help you start preparing for the AP Statistics exam in May. In this video, I wanna walk you through some multiple choice questions that deal with exploring two variable data. Now, these types of questions usually only make up about five to 7% of the multiple choice questions on the exam, but that's still a good chunk, and actually, I think most of these questions are actually quite easy. Now, I can promise that the questions I'm gonna go over in this video are not gonna be the exact same questions you're gonna see on the test, but a lot of the same ideas and concepts will come up. So let's start taking a look at them now. Before we take a look at a couple of practice multiple choice questions for exploring two variable data for the AP stats exams, let's actually look at some formulas that are on the AP statistics formula sheet that could come in handy when working with two variable data. Now, here we see four different formulas. The first one is gonna be very useful. This is the least squares regression line or a regression model for a linear regression line, right? So Y is our predicted value, A is our Y intercept, B is the slope, and X is the explanatory variable. That's definitely gonna come in handy. Now these other formulas over here are to help you find the values A and B by hand. Now you can also find the values of A and B through a computer regression analysis chart, but you can also find them using your calculator, but you can also do it by hand if you actually have all the data. So first you have to find the slope first. So you're going to actually find slope. It's pretty easy by taking the R value, multiplying it by the standard deviation of Y divided by the standard deviation of X. And then to find the A value, you're going to use this formula where you have the average Y, the average X, and the B value that you found first. And then once you plug all those in, you could solve to find A. In fact, what we'd actually do there is we would take the Y average y and subtract b times the average x to get the actual a value. So again, that's how you can find it by hand. And lastly, there's a formula right here to find r by hand. This is your correlation coefficient. Now, I'm going to be completely honest with you. I have never seen an AP stats exam in many, many years that has ever asked you to find the correlation coefficient by hand. It's just never going to happen. So you're really never going to have to use this formula. In 99.999% of the cases, they will give you R in the problem if you're going to be required to use it. All right, so let's take a look at some of the multiple choice questions that come out of this topic. Now, one more thing, real quick. The only other formula that I think you need to know when it comes to exploring two variable data is a formula for residual. Now they do not give you this formula on the formula sheet, but a residual is simply an actual Y value minus the predicted Y value. It's the vertical distance between the actual Y and the predicted Y from the equation right here. So that's, I, I kind of think it should be on the formula sheet, but unfortunately it's not, no big deal, but it's pretty easy formula, but you may need that one for sure. All right, here is the first question I want to take a look at. The residual plots from five different least squares regression lines are shown below. Which of the plots provides the strongest evidence that its regression line is an appropriate model for the data and is consistent with the assumptions required for inference for regression? All right, now, what do we want to see in a residual plot? Nothing we should see no pattern in a residual plot. So if I'm looking at these, A, I clearly see a pattern. B, I clearly see a pattern. In E and D, it's not so much a pattern, more of like an inconsistency, right? So in the beginning, we have very low residuals, and then at the end, we have very large residuals. So we have a mix of residuals, but they're small in the beginning, bigger at the end. And then same thing with D, kind of bigger in the beginning, smaller at the end. That's necessarily not a terrible thing, but that's actually not going to be good for inference for regression. So which one is going to be the absolute best showing that our regression model is perfect and we can use inference for regression is going to be C. We notice that when we kind of put in that zero line, we have positive residuals, we have negative residuals, we have some positive residuals in the beginning, the middle, and the end. We have negative residuals in the beginning, the middle, the end. It's that really nice kind of a um, no pattern that we want to see in the residual plot. Okay, next question is not for quantitative data, but for categorical data. So a local company is interested in supporting environmentally friendly initiatives such as carpooling among employees. The company surveyed all of the 200 employees at the downtown office. Employees responded to whether or not they owned a car and to the location of their home where they live. The results are in the table below. So first we ask the question, do you own a car? Yes or no? 60 people said yes, 140 people said no. Then we said, all right, where, where do you live? Where's your home? Is it in the downtown area, in the city? Elsewhere in the city, just not the downtown area, or is it literally outside the city? So we see the results of 70, 70, and 60 there as well. Now all of the conditional numbers on the inside are values that intertwine those two 
variables. So which of the following statements about a randomly chosen person from these 200 employees is true? I'm actually going to start at the bottom of the list. E says the person is more likely to own a car than to not own a car. Well, if we actually look at the numbers, 60 out of 200 people own a car. That is about 30%. 140 out of 200 people did not own a car. That's 70%. So this question is completely wrong. It has it completely backwards. You're less likely to own a car than to own uh, to own a car than to not own a car. So that's not going to be correct. All right, D says the person is more likely to live in the downtown area in the city than elsewhere in the city. Well, once again, let's look at the numbers. So 70 people surveyed live in the downtown area. 70 out of 200 is 35%. 70 people live elsewhere in the city. That's also 35% out of the 200. So it's not more likely to live in the downtown than elsewhere. It's actually the same. The people in this survey was exactly the same to live in the downtown area versus elsewhere. So that's not our answer either. C says the person is more likely to own a car if he or she lives in the city, downtown or elsewhere, than if she lives outside the city. So for this one, we got to do a little bit of combining. So we're looking at combining the downtown area and elsewhere in the city. So all total city together. So out of that, that's 140 people that live in downtown or elsewhere, and 25 of them own a car. So that's 25 out of 140, and 25 out of 140 is about 18%. Again, I'm looking at the people that own a car that live in the city. So that's the 10 and the 15 out of the 140 that live in the city. Now we're going to compare that to living outside the city, which is 35 out of 60 that own a car, and 35 out of 60 is 58%. So again, they have it backwards. They say that the people who live in the city are more likely to own a car. That's opposite. If you live outside the city, you're more likely to own a car. And that makes sense because you live outside the city. You got to drive in. That one's going to be wrong. All right. The next one says, if the person does not own a car. So we're specifically looking at people who do not own cars, which is this line right here. This row right here is for people who do not own a car. He or she is more likely to live outside the city than to live in the city downtown or elsewhere. So let's, again, we got to combine here. So we have people that do not own a car, 60 and 55 of them live in the downtown area or in the city, elsewhere in the city. So that's again, it's the total. So if we add all those together, 60 plus 55, that's 110 out of the 140. Now, why did my denominator change? Because again, the question says, if a person does not own a car, so I'm only allowed to look at the 140 people that do not own a car. Then I'm going to compare that to the people who live outside the city, which is 25 out of 140 that live outside the city. So once again, the question or the choice says the people, uh, if the people does not own a car, he or she is more likely to live outside the city. I mean, just look at the numbers. It's clearly wrong. If you do not own a car, you're more likely to live in the city. 110 out of 140 versus 25 out of 140. That's not right. So that does leave us with A as the only correct answer, but let's make sure we understand why it's correct. If you own a car, so now we're looking only at the line of people that own a car, he or she is more likely to live elsewhere in the city than to live in the downtown area of the city. So again, just look at the numbers. 15 of the people that own a car live elsewhere in the city versus 10 of the people that own a car live in the downtown area. So that would be true. You're more likely to live elsewhere in the city than the downtown area. Again, if you own a car. So we're only allowed to look at that line right there. All right, so that's it. So so that's a really good reading problem. And it's one of those questions that you don't want to just jump and read the first choice and think, oh yeah, that sounds right. Really take your time to look at all the choices. But there's definitely going to be a problem on the exam or not definitely, like 99% positive, that there's going to be a problem that deals with two categorical variables in a two-way table like this. And you really have to really kind of dive into the numbers to answer some questions about it. All right, this next problem says the computer output below shows the results of a linear regression analysis for predicting the concentration of zinc in parts per million from the concentration of lead in parts per million found in fish of a certain river. Now, please, you better know for the exam how to interpret one of these computer output linear regression analysis, right? They're actually really, really easy. The numbers that matter to you the most are the very first numbers in the coefficient. And they do go in alphabetical order, A on top of B. That's your y-intercept in your slope. So if I'm going to quickly make my equation, y hat is going to be 16.3 plus 19.0 times x. So very simple there to quickly make that. Again, that's your A and your B, your y-intercept in your slope. 
Now the question says, which of the following statements is a correct interpretation of the value of 19? Okay, so they want us to explain in context, what does that 19 mean? Now here's my recommendation for how to interpret slope. So first we got to recognize that that is the slope. Slope is always a number over one. So just put it over one, even if it's a decimal, doesn't matter, put it over one, because slope is a change in y over a change in x, right? So we need two numbers. So the bottom is always your x, the top is always your y. Again, go back to algebra class, it's change in y over change of x. Now the question is, what's y and what's x? Well, in a regression model problem, whatever you're trying to predict is automatically your y. So go back and read the problem. What are we trying to predict? We're trying to predict the concentration of zinc. So y is my zinc in parts per million, and we're trying to predict the zinc from the concentration of lead, so that's going to be my x. So x is my lead, also in parts per million. Now, if you're looking for one more hint, whatever word is next to the slope, so there's the 19, right next to it is always going to be your x variable. So that's another way we could have known that the x variable was lead, which means the remaining variable, or the zinc, would be the y. So now I'm ready to interpret. The interpretation is that for every one part per million of lead concentration that we increase, the zinc concentration is predicted to increase by 19. So the zinc will go up 19, predicted to go up 19, as the lead goes up by 1. So now we just got to read the choices and which one says that. All right, C and D are wrong. If you read those, those are actually interpreting the 19 as the y-intercept, and the y-intercept is 16.3, not the 19. E is trying to turn it into a percentage and try to have something to do with um, coefficient of determination. Well, that's R squared. In fact, if the question asks about R squared, then 82% of the variability in zinc concentration is predicted by the least squares regression model. That would be true, but that's not what the question is asking about. So A and B are talking about slope correctly, but one is reversed. So we're looking at the one where the 19 is the zinc and the one is the lead. Again, that's why it's so important that you create that little fraction. So which one is the 19 is the zinc? That's going to be B, saying that we predict an increase of 19 for the zinc for every one increase of the lead in the fish. So there's your correct answer, B. Really take your time with that one. Hopefully you could get rid of C, D, and E really quickly just by knowing that the 19 is the slope, and then you've got to really make that fraction to make the best choice there. All right, here's the next question. A researcher collected data on the latitude in degrees north of the equator and the average low temperature in degrees Fahrenheit for a random sample of cities in Europe. The data were used to create the following equation for the least squares regression line. So here's our equation. We see that the predicted average low temperature is our y-intercept, 65.5, minus our slope of 0.7 times the latitude. Which of the following is the best interpretation of the slope? Okay, awesome. Same, similar problem that we just saw, but instead of giving you one of those computer output tables, we're giving you the actual equation. So I'm going to take my slope, negative 0.70. I'm going to make it a fraction by putting it over 1. Okay, now i got to remember the 1 is the x, the y is the actual slope value, the negative 0.70. Now again, what's x, what's y? Whatever we're trying to predict is your y. So the y is going to be the average temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. The x is going to be your x variable, which is our latitude, degrees north of the equator. So that's going to be degrees north of equator. Okay, so which one says this correctly? So I'm thinking ahead for every one degree more north of the equator that we go, the average temperature decreases by 0.7 degrees. The more north you go, the colder it gets. I mean, come on, that's common sense, right? So which one says that correctly? Well, we got to read through our choices here and make the best choice, but hopefully you read B and agree with it. For each one degree north of the equator increase, that's my X in the denominator, the predicted average low temperature decreases on average by 0.7 degrees. Awesome. Now be very, very careful because A says increase, but no, 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 no. Our slope was negative, so that's why it's a decrease, so don't get fooled by that one. A couple of the other choices switch the X and the Y variables around, so don't be fooled into choosing that either. So the correct answer here is B. Make that best choice. Um, and again, I really think creating that fraction helps tremendously.
All right, that's actually it for the questions that I have that cover it. Again, very few questions. Again, maybe about this many, maybe about four to five questions on the AP exam, multiple choice wise, will actually cover two variable data, but be ready for them. The only other thing, and again, I actually already mentioned at the beginning of this video, is residuals. That is a very common question. It just wasn't on it this year, but there could be a question that deals with finding residuals, and just know that a residual is the actual Y minus the predicted Y, so it's that vertical distance. So if I kind of have a linear regression here, and here is a point. It's this vertical distance right there between the predicted value from the line and the actual value from the point. A positive residual is above the line, which means that, you know, a couple different ways of looking at it, but it means the prediction was an underestimate because the prediction was under what actually occurred. If we want to quickly show you a negative residual, here would be a negative residual where the vertical distance, there it is, and this is the prediction from the line. And notice that the actual point was below. That's going to produce a negative residual, which means my prediction was an overestimate of what actually happened. But again, how do you get this value? Well, you have to be given your data, right? It's got to be given to you. It's, it's, it's one of the actual points in the data. How do you get the predicted Y? Well, that's where you have to use your equation. So make sure you know how to get the equation, whether it's given to you or you could get it from one of those computer outputs. And then with the equation, you could get your predicted value. And then all you got to do is subtract them to get your residual. So overall, not too, too bad there. But understanding that formula for residuals and understanding a positive versus negative residual is I'm not going to say it's definitely going to come up because this particular year that I'm showing you questions for, it didn't come up, but it definitely could come up on the exam for sure. All right, that's it. See you in the next video.